OK. So last time, I forgot to bring my chalk and I'll get us little pieces. We were talking about growth. When we talk about growth now, we should be recognizing that what we're thinking about is irreversible changes in size, shape, volume, things like that. So this is an irreversible process. And it has to do with the loosening of the wall that allows the cell to expand. And whether that loosening occurs generally over the whole surface of the cell or whether it occurs in one localized position, where that happens and the pattern of the micro, uh, cellulose microfibrils in the cell wall will determine how the cell will expand from that point. Okay? So the growth represents this irreversible change in the shape and the size. Okay. We should recognize that growth can be applied at the cellular level and at the tissue or organ level and the whole plant level, and that it's relatively quantitative. That is, we can measure changes in size, changes in shape. But when we talk about differentiation, this is related to changes in function. Changes in function mean change in structure and change in composition. So these differentiation is much more qualitative. We can't necessarily numerically describe differentiation in the same way that we can growth. And we can bring these two together and talk about development. So one of the things that we should keep in mind, we said that growth is irreversible. But differentiation is not. We've already seen some examples of this, where cells that are mature, for example, paracycle and cortical cells in roots, which start to divide in response to signals from rhizobia in the soil. Right? So these cells that were mature and had stopped dividing, start dividing again to make new tissues for these rhizobia to live in. And lateral root formation. So the cortical cells and the paracycle cells in the lateral root that have stopped dividing can start dividing again, making new meristematic cells to produce a new root. So although growth is irreversible, differentiation under the right conditions can be reversible. And we'll, talk, we'll give some specific examples of that as we go along. Yes? Um, so, so that might be like dividing can happen, but can cells switch their, you know, once they differentiate, can they switch what their purpose or function is? Sure, sure. So if you think about um, the paracycle in the root, so just inside the vascular cylinder, those cells, when they're mature, they're, they've stopped dividing. Um, and towards the root tip, they're majorly involved in transport from the outer surface of the root into the vascular bundle. But what happens if a lateral root forms at that point? That cell converts from a non-dividing cell that's basically involved in transport into a rapidly dividing cell that's part of the new root apical meristem. Right? So that's a complete change in size, shape, function, all sorts of things. Right? So that, yeah, there's, all of those things are possible. And you don't want to treat the de-differentiation that happens under those circumstances is being any different than what happens in, for example, the zygote. That zygote divides and forms two different cells, and each of those cells follows a different developmental path. Our question for today is to figure out what are the things that guide that, because development is not random. Development is very well programmed, and we want to think about what that programming is that allows development to happen in sort of a logical way. Development, whether we're talking about formation of a shoot apical meristem, whether we're talking about formation of a leaf or, or a flower, or any of those sorts of things. Okay? One other thing that we need to keep in mind about all this, and something that you know, but we often forget about in the context of thinking about development, and that's the idea of 
totipotency. Remember, this basically means that all cells have the same genetic information in them. Right? So every single cell has all the information in it to make a whole new plant. That was actually first accomplished experimentally right here in this building by F.C. Stewart back in the 1930s. He cloned uh, carrot cells, I believe it was. He took cells from a carrot, single cells from a carrot, and grew a whole new carrot plant out of it. Okay? So this was one of the first indications that every cell in an organism has the ability to reproduce a whole new organism. So the question that really fo we want to focus on is what is the information that guides going from a single cell, whether it's a zygote or whether it's a cell that's artificially removed from an organism, that guides it through this developmental process so you end up with a whole new organism again. Okay, so it's clearly going to be um, a complex process. And this isn't important just from sort of a basic biology perspective. It's very important in terms of biotechnology as well because most of the techniques that involve generation of mutants, that involve generation of genetically modified organisms, involves transforming either individual cells or complex tissues and then selecting out from that population only those cells that have been transformed. Okay? So you've got a cell that's got, got the new gene in it. If it's just sitting there in a cell, it doesn't do you a whole lot of good. You have to regenerate a whole new plant from that cell so that every cell in the plant has the genes that you want in it and presumably will do the things that are necessary. So this ability to take a single cell and produce a whole new organism out of it is extremely important from a biotechnology perspective. Any of you that have taken um, plant cell tissue culture classes know that this is really one of the main limiting factors in biotechnology is our ability to essentially trick a cell, to put the cell in an environment where it perceives the signals that it's taking in is the right signals for that cell to start following a developmental sequence to make a whole new plant again. And so one of the things that I want you to see over the course of the next four weeks' worth of lectures are what are these sorts of signals, what sorts of these signals are going to be important in doing this. How do we start with a callus cell from a carrot and make a whole new carrot plant out of it? You can't just put the cell in water and expect that to happen because that would never happen, for example, with the zygote. It's got to be in a very specific environment with very specific signals in it. Okay. So one of the things that we need to think about in this sort of developmental sequence is where is this information coming from? And we can really define two different sort of types of information. One is related to lineage. That is, if we have one cell, that cell divides and forms two daughter cells. There is information that is passed from cell to cell in terms of not just DNA, DNA is the same for both of these daughter cells, but in terms of, for example, messenger RNAs that might be uh, non-uniformly distributed in the parent cell and therefore end up distributed differently in the daughter cells. So this is information that's completely dependent upon cell lineage, it's information that's passed from one cell to its daughter cells when that cell divides. And this sort of information is extremely important in animals. But it's not very important in most plants. In plants, the information that is important is related to position. Information that's coming from neighboring cells. Those neighboring cells give a new daughter cell information about its position and therefore guides its development. So for plants, we're going to see that position is the key factor in terms of external information. The information, what's inside these cells, except for the sort of lineage-dependent stuff, is the same, same DNA. Right? So for the most part, in plants, it's going to be positional information that's going to give rise to changes in 
path that a cell follows in terms of development. Okay, so in order for a cell to respond to positional information, what must be present in the cell? Receptors and what else? Yeah, the signal transduction pathway. So one of the big things that we need to be thinking about over the course of this lecture and all the subsequent ones are whether or not the signal transduction pathway is present and what that signal transduction pathway consists of. One of the common questions that came up in your uh, assessment of your reading was, auxin seems to do an awful lot of stuff. Auxin, we're, we, it plays a role in development at, in the level of embryogenesis. We're going to see that it plays important roles at the whole plant level. It signals all sorts of things. It's involved in wounding responses and, and flowering and, and everything. How the heck can auxin be involved in all these different things? It must mean that all these different responses have different signal transduction pathways. And the presence or absence of the signal transduction pathway is going to be an important thing that determines how cells respond to positional information. If the signal's there but there's no signal transduction pathway, the cell's not going to respond. Okay, and finally, let's just recognize that when we think about what's going on at, at the whole plant level. Everything that's happening at the whole plant level is completely dependent upon what's happening at the cellular level. That is, the whole plant response is the sum of all the cellular responses. So it makes sense that we focus our attention largely on what's happening at the cellular level now, and later on we'll branch out to think about how these effects um, become important at the whole plant level. Okay. So, in plants, very different from animals, we can divide development basically into two different stages. We have embryonic development, in an embryonic development, the thing that that distinguishes it from what's going to happen next is that most cells are capable of division. So if we look at a, a map of cell division, we start with the zygote and then it divides to form two cells and each of those two cells divide to form other cells and each of those cells divide to form other cells. Basically, every cell is capable of division. But in post-embryonic development, all the cells that are dividing post-embryonically are meristematic cells. So we say only the meristems divide. So there's a real difference between what's happening in, during embryonic development, where most of the cells are capable of dividing, and post-embryonic development, where only the meristematic cells are going to divide. So we're going to look at these in two separate, um, with, through, through two separate uh, sets of glasses. So let's start off with embryonic development. And most of what we know about embryonic development in plants comes from studies in Arabidopsis. And a couple of you asked the interesting question, is what we know about Arabidopsis relevant to all other plants? You know, the textbook continually says, in Arabidopsis we know this, and in Arabidopsis we know that. Well, the answer is, we don't know for sure. It's certainly likely, from, a development, or from an evolutionary perspective, that the main genes that control for example, the pattern formation, so as we go from a single cell to a mature embryo, that the main genes that control these patterns are likely to be conserved across a lot of organisms. There's not going to be a huge amount of diversity there. But there will obviously be some variations on a theme. For example, a monocot 
embryo looks different than a dicot embryo. So there has to be some differences, at least at that level. Okay, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about all the different stages of embryonic development, but what I do, we'll just briefly mention some of the things that are going on here, and then we'll go back and look from a couple of different perspectives at what's happening at the cellular level that gives rise to these various structures there, okay? So starting up here in the upper left, this is actually the point where the first cell division has already happened. There's I have a pointer here, yeah. This embryo contains two cells. It's got a terminal cell, and then it's got, got this sort of long cell here that's um, referred to as the suspensor. So one of the things that we need to be thinking about, we'll I'll warn you about now, and we'll come back to talk about in more detail, is at this point where the first cell division has happened, polarity has already been established. That is, this end of the embryo will be the shoot and this end of the embryo will be the root, right? And that developmental axis is, de is determined, actually we'll see that it's determined, before the first cell division. And that developmental axis must be maintained because we have here the region of the embryo that will be the root and the region of the embryo that will be the shoot. It's there throughout and obviously remains throughout the development of the, of the post-embryonic plant as well. Okay, so this part, this terminal cell here is going to end up being the vast majority of cells that are in the embryo. This basal cell is sort of, you could think of it as almost like the umbilical cord. It's the attachment of the growing embryo to the maternal tissue. It provides a mechanism by which nutrients are supplied to the terminal cell so that it can continue to grow. So the terminal cell goes through a series of very precisely pre-programmed cell divisions forming a globular stage. That globular stage is pretty much radially symmetric to begin with, but very quickly it becomes bilaterally symmetric. That is, there are two perpendicular axes. It's just like us, we're bi bilaterally symmetric. Right? This region right in here we'll see is going to become the shoot apical meristem. This region down here is going to become the root apical meristem. So already very early in embryonic development, things are going on that triggers the long-term characteristics of these cells. This heart-shaped embryo elongates along the root shoot axis. These two extensions here are going to become the cotyledons. So basically by the time development is done, the, the uh, initial components of the root, the shoot, the meristems, and leaves are already there. It's sort of like a mini plant. So those of you that have, you know, for example, eat peanuts, you know, you see those little things that fall out of the peanuts? It has this sort of shape. It's, it's the actual embryo of the plant. So seeds contain this. And one of the things we need to remember, we'll come back to talk about uh, towards the end of the semester, is that there is, in most plants, a break that occurs here. Embryonic development stops because the seeds dry down. Right? Everything becomes inactive in the seed. And it waits for the right conditions to come along for the embryo to germinate. And that post-embryonic development, then, is based entirely upon growth now only in the meristems rather than the sorts of um, cell divisions that are going on in the embryo. Okay. Okay, so as I said right here very early on, this root shoot axis is established. And let's think about the sorts of things that give rise to that, that, uh, that axis. So within the embryonic sac, there's already polarity present in that embryonic sac. So in the maternal tissue, there's information that's present that dictates the root shoot axis. So in the, in the simplest sense, the early divisions of the embryo are being triggered by information that's present in the cells already. That is, there's lineage-dependent information in those early divisions. The zygote is not symmetric 
The zygote contains a large vacuole, and that vacuole is located at the lower end of the cell that's in contact with the maternal tissue. So even within the single-celled zygote, the axis, the shoot root axis has already been established. The first division is not an equal division. The cell that will become the majority of the embryo, the terminal cell, is quite small. And most of the sort of metabolic machinery of the cell, the mitochondria and the, and the endoplasmic reticulum and stuff, end up in this, this terminal cell, while the basal cell is largely a big vacuole, at least to start with. Okay? So even that first division is very asymmetric. So one of the questions that you should be asking yourself is, what is the sort of cellular level information that is guiding the cell to divide, not in the middle, but towards one end, and to keep a certain type of components of the cytoplasm in one end, and the other end be, being largely a vacuole? That is not a random event. That's information that somehow must be pre-programmed into the cell in its DNA. And if that's the case, then there should be mutants that if you alter those genes, will screw this up. Right? And that's basically the way most of development has been studied, by using mutant analysis. And the mutants can be used in basically two different ways. So the traditional forward genetics approach and the reverse genetics Who can tell me the difference between these? What's the difference between a forward genetics and a reverse genetics approach? So. I think forward you start with the gene and you alter it and then look at the phenotype, or maybe that's reverse. Okay. <laughs> that's the other way around. So this one, you start with the phenotype. This is, this is Mendel, right? He saw, he saw plants that were tall or short and he worked towards the gene. And reverse genetics is start with a gene, disrupt the gene, and then observe the phenotype. And most of what we know about development in plants, it's probably true of animals too, although maybe not, as, not so much. Most of what we know is come through the analysis of mutants. So if you, have, if you find a mutant where this first cell division is an equal division rather than being an unequal division, then that should give you some clue that the gene that has been changed encodes a protein that is somehow specifying information related to that cell division. So and we see, we'll, we'll, we'll see in just a, a couple of minutes, some really bizarre shaped embryos in plants that arise as the result of different types of mutations. That tells you that those mutations are encoding proteins that one way or another are involved in controlling development, controlling the plane of cell division. So if the first division happened this way rather than this way, you'd end up with an embryo that had very strange characteristics. Right? So all of these things are programmed in a very specific way in order to bring about the result, make a mature plant, or at least a mature embryo. And if you change that, we're going to end up with shapes that are going to be uh, somewhat different. Um, yes? Sure. So, so you could do random mutagenesis and pick out interesting phenotypes. So, we're going to see when we talk about plant hormones um, that that approach has been used to identify. So um, there's, a, there's a classic picture in the textbook of ethylene mutants. So in the presence of ethylene, seedlings don't grow very much. They remain relatively short. So you, you expose plants to ethylene, and mutants that are insensitive to ethylene will grow normal, big and tall. 
and all the ethylene, the normal mutants will be very short. So you don't, you're, not, you're not really trying to disrupt any specific gene. You disrupt every gene you can find, germinate them, and see which plants are insensitive to ethylene. Or the other way around, plants that are short even when there's no ethylene present. Right? So you can do this either in a very specific way. Here's a gene whose expression pattern shows up early in the heart stage of embryogenesis. Right? So disrupt that gene to see what happens. Or just disrupt all genes and see whether what, what uh, embryogenesis mutants show up. Right? Both of them are, are relevant approaches. But I think the, the take home message that I've already mentioned to you, but you're going to see time and time again, is what this approach does is gives you a picture that's a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle where you only have 10 or 20 pieces in. And you're trying to figure out what the whole picture is. Because there's lots of genes involved in this. And this will only, this will only identify typically these mutations that lead to phenotypes that have altered embryogenesis are due to a single gene. So you're identified one gene that's involved, but what that gene is actually doing and how it fits in with the hundred other genes that may be involved is a much more challenging thing to sort out. We'll see some of the techniques that are used to do that in just a minute. Okay, so let's think about the information that is giving rise to the shoot root axis, the axis of the polarity axis that's associated with the long axis of the plant. What are the sorts of things that are giving rise to that? Well, we can see already that there must be some lineage dependent information because this, polar this polarity is showing up in the very first division there. But there's also positional information because this end of the zygote is the end that's in contact with maternal tissue. This end of the zygote is not. If you could go in there and manually flip that cell around before the first division happened, the vacuole would move to the other end, all the, the mitochondria and stuff would move to the, to the terminal end of it, and you'd get the same sort of cell division. So there's both positional and lineage information in, in these early divisions. But later on, almost all the information that gives rise to these complex structures is positional information. And let's look at some of the things that give rise to that. Oh, let's, let's take one, one brief diversion here. This is a very interesting figure, and, and many of you questioned what it was really telling you. Um, the amount of information they give you in the textbook to understand what this figure is is pretty poor. So let's just quickly go through this so you can see what's going on here. This is a very clever way to follow lineage-dependent information. And the way that's done is to transform a plant with a construct that's got a reporter gene. So for example, GUS. It's a gene that when you add in a specific substrate, it turns cells in which this gene is being expressed, turns them blue. Okay? So the way they do this is in the regulatory part of the, of the um, gene, you put a transpose on there. And transposons can randomly jump out. When the transposon is in the gene, the reporter gene is not expressed. Once the transposon jumps out, it stays out. That is, in every cell that's derived from a cell in which the, the transposon jumped out, the reporter gene will be on. That cell will turn blue. Right? So the first cell that that happens in will be blue. And every subsequent cell that is derived from this cell by cell division, by lineage, will also be blue. So it allows you to be able to trace visually the lineage of a cell. It started with this one cell, and all these other cells are divided from it. Okay? Now what this map represents here, it's doesn't, not telling you at all, but along this vertical axis represents different developmental regions within the embryo. So we're talking about the stuff below zero here. I don't know why they call it zero, but everything below zero here is root related. Stuff between three and zero is hypocotyl related. So we're looking at functional divisions 
in groups of cells within the plant. And then we have these various patterns of where the blue cell lines show up. So these represent different lineages, and they're divided into these categories based upon where that, where that cell first shows up and how many cells in the plant, in a developmental sense, have the, or where those cell lines show up. So for example, we can see that in this category D here, most of the cells are developing above the hypocotyl root boundary. But a few of them are below that boundary. If we look here, most at E, most of these cells are developing below that boundary, but some of them are above it. What this means is that cells that start off above the boundary mostly don't, mo these cells, if you get the, this, um, the transposon hopping out, most of these cells remain above that boundary, but some of them extend below the boundary. Vice versa for these cells down here. Most of them remain below the boundary, but some of them go above the boundary. That's telling you that it cannot be lineage-dependent information, because if it was, this boundary would be very exact. The fact that some cells cross this boundary means their function is being determined by position and not by lineage. Jenna. Yep. How do we know that, because there could be two things happening. One is the cell, like the original cell was at zero, and then it, all, it just divided up and down a little bit, or that it started like here and then divided right. up. So we how do we know which one? We don't know within this group of cells whether where that first cell came from. We only know what the, what the range of cells that have the blue in it Represents. So we let the, the embryo grow to maturity, and we find some groups of cells that are, that are pretty much remain within this hypocotyl region. We find a whole bunch of cells or cell lines where it remains only within the root region. But we see some interesting ones where they cross over that boundary. If it was lineage dependent, if it was only dependent upon where, what cell was the parent for these cells, that determine the function, this line would be very distinct. The fact that it's not means that cells that start off in one lineage can change their function depending upon where they're located. Okay? Stella. So is it different uh, how, how can you depend on the transposon leaving? Or, or could it's totally random. Could a transposon jump into this and, and, and affect? Yes, it could. But the likelihood of it jumping into that gene is much lower than the likelihood of it jumping out. Right? So that mostly what you're seeing there is turning on expression of that gene because the transposon left, not turning off of the gene because the transposon came back in. Yeah. Are those representing all the descendants of the cell? Or these represent, the A, B, C, D, E, F represent categories of cell lineages that are, that are constrained within a certain region. So for example, all of these cells in this D region are largely constrained to be between this 0 to 3 represents the hypocotyl. Right? So, all of these start within the hypocotyl and remain within the hypocotyl, except for a few of them down here, which extend down into the root region a little bit. Okay, so these categories have been arbitrarily defined based on what part of the embryo the, the labeled cells show up in. So this, the, where, the, where in the developing embryo this transposon jumped out will be variable. Right? It could have happened in the first cell that will give rise to all the cells of the hypocotyl, or it could have happened in the last cell. Right? So that's why you see differences in the, the, the number of cells that are contributing to it. Could it have happened in more than one cell? Yeah, sure. Right? So this doesn't represent, this represents measurements not over a single embryo, but over lots and lots of embryos. Below the line, or it could have been 
you could have you could have the transposon jumping out within a given embryo happening in several different cells. But the way the experiment is set up is to try and make it so that it happens only on average once per embryo. If it happened twice per embryo, it could end up that those two cell lineages overlap with each other and you wouldn't really be able to tell them apart. But if you only have one incidence per embryo, then you know that corresponds to a single cell lineage. And that's what they're trying to do in this experiment, is look in each case at a lineage that's derived from a single transposon hopping event. That every cell that is a daughter from that original cell has the blue color in it, and no other cells have it. A little more clear on this? You should be, here's, here's the challenge for next time. Be thinking about how this region of overlap here gives you information about whether it is lineage or position dependent information. That's really the take home message from this. That this evidence supports the idea that there is position de dependent information in plants. This is not the only evidence. There's much better evidence than this from other experiments. For example, mutations that affect embryo embryogenesis. You can have a mutation that affects embryogenesis. That mutation is present in every cell in the embryo. And yet, the embryo develops to a large extent relatively normally. Right? There can be, I mean, there are some that are pretty weird. But in general, mutations that affect patterns of cell division have relatively localized effects. The rest of the patterns of cell division remain intact. That's because the information that's primarily directing what happens to the daughter cells, the different developmental paths that the daughter cells follow, is coming from positional information rather than lineage information. Okay, so let's think about, start thinking about what sorts of things can signal positions in cells. And one of the earliest things that came out from studying um, the development of the shoot root axis in plants is asymmetric distributions of auxin. So auxin we'll see is a plant hormone. It's a relatively small molecule. And auxin moves around in the plant by very different mechanism than we would expect. We might expect that long distance transport of auxin occurs in the xylem and the phloem. It does not. Long and short distance transport of, of auxin occurs by the same mechanism and it requires the presence of specific transporters in the plasma membrane to move auxin from cell to cell. That's good because what it means is if we can localize where those transporters are, then we can tell which way the auxin is moving. So one of the things that's seen early on is that the transporters that are present in the two-cell two embryo is, are largely located at the upper region of the basal cell. So that tells you that auxin is being transported out of the basal cell towards the terminal cell. Right? So auxin is largely being synthesized in the basal cell, but it's being concentrated in the terminal cell. That is local information that is deter helping to determine root shoot axis. Once you get to the globular stage, the direction the auxin moves is different. It's moving in general from the cells in the globular stage down towards the suspensor. Once the heart stage gets to be a little bit more developed, the movement of auxin becomes a lot more complicated. The one thing I want to focus on is that although auxin tends to be made up here in this central region of the, of the heart, this is the region that will become the shoot apical meristem, that auxin does not accumulate there, it's transported away from there. A key factor that's involved in the formation of the shoot apical meristem is low auxin content of the cells, even though the cells are the source of auxin for much of the rest of the embryo. 
So the auxin that's being made in these cells is being transported out because there's lots of transporters that are located on the periphery of the cells to move it out into neighboring cells. So a lot of the polarity, a lot of the asymmetry that is being set up in the developing embryo has to do with where these auxin transport proteins are located. What determines where the auxin transport proteins are located? In other words, to get the auxin to move from these cells to these cells, the auxin transporters have to be located on this side of the cell, not on this side of the cell. What determines that? Has to be something related to position. In other words, there has to have been information that the cells got previous to this to tell them where to put those transporters. And you can just keep following that back all the way along the path from the single cell to here. There has to be pre-existing information that tells the cell, move the transporters there, or make the signal transduction pathway or don't make that signal transduction pathway. In order for a cell to respond to a signal, a, a parent cell divides and forms two daughter cells. Those daughter cells follow different developmental paths. In order to follow different developmental paths, they have to respond to different signals. The ability to respond to those signals has to be there at the time the signal arrives. If the signal transduction pathway that responds to the signal isn't there, the cell can't do anything. So every response that the cell does has to be pre-existing information that sets up the cell to be able to, to carry out that response. The signal transduction pathway is either there or it's not there. If you think about you know, cells that are going to become parts of the roots, they are not going to express signal transduction pathways that help them determine whether they're going to be leaves or stems and vice versa. So there are very specific signal transduction pathways that are set up in patterns of cells that have to be determined prior to the signal coming along. And it's really important that you understand how that happens, that that must happen, not so much how it happens. Okay. So let's take a quick look at some of the mutants that have been um, analyzed in terms of embryogenesis in Arabidopsis. Not so much in terms of really focusing on what the mutations are in, because as I said, they're in, one of them's in uh, steroid biosynthesis, one's in lipid biosynthesis. How do those things give rise to um, mutants that either are missing, you know, the whole apical part of it, and you've basically just got the hypocotyl in the root, or you're missing the whole basal part of it, and you've just got the the shoot apical meristem and the cotyledons, or one where you lose both the apical and the, sorry, the, the shoot apical and root apical regions and just have everything in between or miss everything in between. Now, these, are, these are mutations that affect patterning. That's the thing that you need to take away, that there are mutations here that are controlling how cell divisions and how the daughters of those cell divisions move forward in embryogenesis. So you should be able to think about, for example, if there's a mutation that affects the development of the basal region of the plant, of the embryo, where is that mutation likely to have occurred? Where in the development of the embryo we would, would we expect that a mutation that affected this pattern to have occurred. Well, one of the things that we can do is look at if this whole part of the embryo is missing, this whole part is missing, if we follow the lineage of the cell divisions, we should get back to the point where we could say, well, if this is what's missing, then some cell division between maybe in this region here has led to the lack of cells that end up being part of the, the hypocotyl in the root. So by following cell lineage, we can figure out where a specific mutation is having its effect. That cell divisions that happened early in this globular stage give rise to a phenotype 
where it's missing basically the whole hypocotyl and root. That's the sort of thing I want you to be able to see. I don't care that you know the specifics of how these mutations work. For the most part, we don't understand that. And right? I'm not going to expect you to. But you should see the general pattern in terms of types of mutations and the developmental sequence that could give rise to them. Is that clear? Yeah, OK. All right, let's go back then for just one second. and draw ourselves a simple picture. So up here we've got the zygote, single cell. And that cell is going to divide to form two daughter cells. And each of one of those daughter cells is going to divide, and so on. What I want to do is think about, get you to think about the different types of signal transduction pathways that are going to be present in these cells. So in this first division, one of these cells becomes the terminal cell that will give rise to virtually all the rest of the embryo. And the other one of these cells is going to be the basal cell that gives rise to the suspensor. So it may be that most of the information that determine this basal terminal characteristics is lineage dependent information. It came from the, from the fertilized zygote. But subsequent to this, almost all the information that determines what's going on is coming from positional information. So the question is, does the terminal cell, do the terminal cell and the basal cell express the same signal transduction pathways? I see one yes and I see one no. Who thinks yes? Who thinks they're going to express the same signal transduction pathways? No one? Who thinks they're going to express different signal transduction pathways? That means more than half of you are clueless on this. Right? Are these cells, are the daughter cells of these two cells going to follow the same developmental paths? No. Does that mean in order to distinguish what the daughter cells of the basal cell are going to do, that these daughter cells need different signal transduction pathways than the daughter cells from the terminal cell? Yes. So right away you should see that there has to be determined already at the level of the first two cells, you know, right here. There has to be different signal transduction pathways in these cells in order for their daughter cells to be able to respond to signals that make them follow different signal transduction pathways. That basically every step we go down in this cell lineage, there are different signal transduction pathways being expressed in the cells over here that are maybe going to become root cells and the cells over here that are maybe going to become leaf or shoot apical meristem or whatever cells. So throughout this whole pattern, there's different sequences of signal transduction pathways that are turned on. And once they've been used, do you think they're going to be expressed in subsequent cells? Probably not. So there'll be some, some signal transduction pathways that are expressed up here and not further down, and some that are expressed further down but not up here. What you should come away with is that this is a very highly choreographed process. That the signal transduction pathways have to be there in the cells that are going to respond at the time the signals arrived. So the determining which signal transduction pathways are there happens previously to the signal, not at the time the signal arrives. And that's important to understand that distinction. Okay. We all right with that? That makes sense? Okay, so let's go on. I'm going to skip this for the sake of time. Let's go on to talk about what's happening in post embryonic growth. Once we get the embryo germinates and we start to get growth that is dependent only upon the meristematic regions. And basically, we're going to focus on the two main types of meristems that are present in all plants 
the shoot and the root apical meristems. So this is a diagram from your book that is basically showing what's going on in a growing root. And it divides the root up into three different zones associated with development. The zone down here where cell division is occurring, the meristematic zone. That is followed by a zone in which the primary thing that's going on is cell elongation. Now, is there elongation going on down here in the meristematic zone? Yes, probably. But there's not much cell division going on in the elongation zone. Cell division is pretty much localized down here. We go further up along the, the root, we get into the maturation zone, and this is where cell function is being established. So for example, the various colors in here represent xylem and phloem that are developing. There's, down in here, there's protoxylem and protofloam, that's the cells that will ultimately become them, but they're not done developing until they're up in this region. One of the most obvious uh, indications of the zone of maturation is the presence of the root hairs. Okay? These, these epidermal cells that produce the root hairs, this, these root hairs are developing not down here where the cells are elongated or where they're dividing, but where, they're, uh, uh, where the cells are maturing. Why does it make sense that root hairs are developing in this part of the plant and not down here? Okay, but let's relate those functions together then. What other functions are developing in that region? Oh, well, I think that's kind of a different idea. Okay. Uh, well, like, the cell kind of using it as a source to kind of grow and elongate it. I'm going to bring up the soil so the plant can have root hairs right then and there. So not to have root hairs down here? Yeah. Yeah, so root hairs down here might, are more likely maybe to be damaged because they're, the point, they're at the point where the root is pushing through. Also, so, like, I mean, most of the most of these roots there are used up to kind of grow downward. For so, cell division? Yeah. yeah. Okay. What do root hairs do for the plant? They expand the area for absorption. Yeah, for uptake. Okay. So would it make sense to have root hairs in a region of the root where there's no xylem that can transport things away from there? Right? So in other words, the development of the root hairs is coordinated with the development of the xylem. Don't treat those things as being independent. They're linked together because it wouldn't make any sense to have root hairs down here. Anna's correct in terms of this is the part that's pushing through the soil, but it's also because there's rel relatively little absorption that goes on down here because there's no way to get the things that, can be that are absorbed to transport them out. It's not until you get further up in the root that the xylem develops that that's going to work. Yes. Good question. How do they get there? So, for example, these cells, they need lots of carbon to make new cells, right? How does it get there? Yeah, it's diffusion symplastically. So, this distance is pretty small. Okay. We're talk this is So, what is this distance? The distance between the tip and where the root hairs start to show up. It's a millimeter or so. Yeah, it's pretty small. So diffusion can happen reasonably well over that distance. Yeah. Okay, let's look at a little bit more detail what's going on down here in the meristematic zone. And this is data from Arabidopsis. So here's a micrograph of an Arabidopsis root. And basically, here's a picture of the meristem, the root apical meristem. And the cells in here that are labeled uh, maybe they're not labeled. They're labeled stem cells. They're, they're either called stem cells or initials. These are the cells that are dividing to produce all the other cells in, in the root. The number of cells that are actually dividing and remaining meristematic is only a handful of cells in Arabidopsis. In larger plants, the meristems can be significantly larger. So one of the advantages of studying development in Arabidopsis is that it's relatively easy to follow cell lineages because there's a relatively small number of cells in which all the other cells from the root are being derived. So the cells here at the bottom 
When these divide, the only types of cells they form are cells that are associated with the root cap. When these cells over here divide, they form two types of cells. They form the epidermis and they form these lateral root cap cells. When these cells up here divide, they lead to the formation of cells that are inside the steel, inside the vascular, inside the vascular bundle. So already at the level of the meristem, the daughter cells that are derived from those divisions are linked to specific functions. Now is that linkage lineage dependent or is it position dependent? How would you test that? How would you test whether a cell that's derived from a division right here is predestined to become part of the vascular bundle or whether, whether it becomes part of the vascular bundle because of information it's, that's coming from its neighbors? Good. Yeah, so one way to do it would be to isolate those cells and put them into environment and see whether they only could make uh, cells that would be part of the vascular bundle or whether they could make epidermal cells depending on whether you change the environment. Jonathan, what were you going to say? I was just going to say you change the position of the cell. Yeah, you could literally move the cell. You could take a laser in there and you could blate away some of the neighbors and see what happens. Right? So both these sorts of experiments have been done. And it's very clear that the information that is guiding the fates of these cells is positional and not lineage dependent. So once you get to the level of meristems, the lineage dependence is basically gone. All of the information is positional. So let's think about one of these meristem cells. When it divides, it forms two daughter cells. What are the fates of these two daughter cells? Can they, can they go in different developmental directions? Can they both go in different developmental directions? Potentially, yes. But if this cell divides and this one becomes part of the vascular tissue and this becomes epidermis, what happened? You lost your meristematic cell. When meristem cells divide, one of the two daughters must remain meristematic. When this cell divides up here, the cell on this side, because of positional information, follows a developmental path that leads to formation of you know, the paracycle or something like that. The cell that's on this side remains part of the meristem. If they both followed different developmental paths, there'd be no meristem left after 20 or 30 divisions. Right? So one of the most important things that has to happen in the meristem is that cell division, the positional information, keeps one of those cells meristematic and lets the other follow a developmental path. So that means there must be signals coming from within the meristem that keeps the cells that are closest to the meristem meristematic and lets the cells that are further away from the meristem, the daughter cell, follow a different developmental path. And that's the interesting role that these cells in the center of the meristem that normally don't divide, they're called the quiescent center. Those cells play a key role in producing the signals that keep their neighbors meristematic. But they also play a key role if one of these cells is damaged. The quiescent cells can divide to regenerate the lost meristematic cell. So there's built into this meristem the ability to replace meristematic cells if they're damaged. It seems relatively important from an evolutionary perspective. How many meristem cells are there? Like how many do they maintain? Depends on the plant. So in Arabidopsis and the shoot in the root apical meristem, I can't remember, it's on the order of 30, something like that. Maybe somebody knows better, but it's it's a relatively small number. In other plants, I believe like in maize, it's it's much larger than that. It's more like a hundred cells. Okay? So this is an easy one to study because it's a relatively small number of cells. 
Okay, so if you say a mirror stem is damaged, do you mean partially damaged or completely removed? Mm -hmm. Completely removed. So if you remove a mirror stem, do other cells that were developing to, into whatever, vascular tissue, whatever, become mirror stem? Typically, no. No. So that, that growing tip, if you cut the mirror stem off, is lost. But we'll see what happens in terms of processes that are further down along the, the axis of the root or the shoot. So those of you who are gardeners know that if you pinch the tip off the growing tip of a flower, all the axillary buds down the stem below that start growing and you get a branch, you get a plant that produces branches that have 20 flowers on it rather than a branch that has one flower on it. Similar things happen with um, lateral root growth if you, if you damage the, the uh, root tip. So the cells immediately adjacent to this do not take over meristematic function, but cells in other places do take over meristematic function. Well, as I said, we'll, we'll give some more examples of that. Okay. Uh, let's switch to the shoot apical meristem. Shoot apical meristem is a lot more complicated. So in the root, you know, basically you're producing this nice linear structure. The shoot apical meristem, we got a linear shoot, but coming off of that shoot, we have leaves, right? And those leaves are actually set in a relatively fixed pattern. It's called phyllotaxy. Phyllotaxy, depending on how you want to produce, pronounce it. It's the pattern of leaf emergence radially around the, the axis. So as the axis grows, you might have one leaf coming off on this side, the next leaf coming off exactly opposite, or you could have the leaves coming around in a spiral. We'll talk some more about this and well, we may not get to it today. But so this pattern of leaf formation is on the shoot apical meristem is something that's very important. It's going to determine what the branch looks like, what the distribution of leaves is going to look like. So we need to think about this in a little bit more detail. So if we look at the picture of a shoot apical meristem, so this is at the very growing tip of the plant. These bulges that you see out here are developing leaves. They're called leaf primordia. And we can divide the meristem up into groups of cells based on, on two different characteristics. We have this zonal um, categorization of the central zone and the peripheral zones. The peripheral zones are what give rise to the leaf primordia. So these regions that are stained dark here are regions where cells are dividing more rapidly. The more rapid growth of cells here leads to a little bulge of cells which will eventually become a leaf. Right? So it's within this peripheral zone that the positions of leaves is determined. But the cells, where the cell will be located, for example, within the leaf, is determined by the layer in the, um, in the apical meristem. So the outer layer of cells, not surprisingly, gives rise to the outermost layers of the, of the leaves. And the inner layers here represent different, different um, groups of cells that give rise to the inner parts of the leaf. And interestingly, you can get mutations that occur in these different layers that end up with leaves having different characteristics on the surface than in the inner cells. You've seen these leaves. Um, coleus is a really good example. They're leaves that have, appear to have on the outside of the leaf, maybe a red color, and in between, sort of a greenish color, and in the middle, kind of a, a white color. Those represent mutations that occur in these different layers and then uh, end up in different parts of the leaf. So the structure of the meristem is set up in such a way that there's a very regular pattern of cell division that goes from this sort of, in, this sort of homogeneous dome of cells to form all the leaves, and eventually if this, this meristem changes to a floral meristem to produce the flowers as well, all of that information is built into the patterning of uh, transcription factors that are expressed in various parts of the, of the meristem.
Okay, let's just take a, a minute to talk about some of the sorts of mutations that give rise to mirror stems that behave differently. So in, um, during embryogenesis, the establishment of the shoot apical meristem also gives rise to the bilateral symmetry. That is, in a dicot, you've got two cotyledons that basically point out in opposite directions relative to each other. So there's a symmetry axis that runs this way, and there's a symmetry axis that runs this way. There are mutations that lead to the formation of embryos that lack that bilateral symmetry. There's just radial symmetry in this. In other words, the cotyledons are basically fused to form this sort of donut-shaped thing here. And you might ask, well, then, there must be certain genes whose expression is set up to establish this bilateral symmetry. And the, 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 the mutation that causes this cup-shaped embryo is called CUC, cup-shaped cotyledons. And that CUC mutation is a protein whose expression sets up this bilateral symmetry. If that protein is altered, that bilateral symmetry does not, is not expressed, and you get a radially symmetric embryo where this represents all cotyledon tissues that sort of fuse together. It's as if you took this thing and you just rotated it all around, and you've got cotyledon tissue forming this donut-shaped thing there. So this is another example of mutations that give rise to specific patterns. Yes? Good question. Would you expect this embryo to develop into a normal plant? No. No, it wouldn't. Right? So most, most of these sorts of mutations that affect embryogenesis are embryo lethal. Right? So you may be able to make a functional embryo, but it can't develop into a complete plant. So it makes studying inheritance of characteristics, for example, a little bit more challenging. OK, uh, one more thing I'll mention. We know that the cells that sit right here in the base, in the sort of crotch between the cotyledons, these are the cells that are destined to become part, become the shoot apical meristem. And one question that, that people have asked is, what are the patterns of gene expression that set up these cells to become the shoot apical meristem? How would you go about doing this? How, if you wanted to figure out what are the, what's the positional information that gives rise to cells in this region becoming the shoot apical meristem? How would you go about doing that? How would you do that experiment? Um, well, I don't know about this, but uh, maybe you could like, cut the, the things like this from the heart. You know what I mean? Like maybe cut like you, yeah, this you off? Of those, yeah. Maybe something will happen. OK. So you could do an experiment where basically uh, you ablate off different tissues and see how removing specific cells affect the development of the shoot apical meristem. Yeah, that would work, right? So if you remove the cotyledons and you didn't get any shoot apical meristem or you remove these cells here that are ultimately going to give rise to the cotyledons and you don't see any shoot apical meristem, you'd say there's some signaling coming from those guys that's important. Yeah, that's a good way to do it. How about another way? Well, the um, pathogen-free material like with no... Um you could get a whole new plant out of it, but how would that tell you what is the information that's derived in producing that nerve cell? Well, it must come from itself. It must be within the nerve Okay, so if you remove this nerve stem and, think, and the, the plant, uh, the embryo continues to develop normally, then yeah, that would tell you that other cells that were non-meristematic could become meristematic when you cut the meristem out. Oh, sure, you can do that. 
embryo can't be grown anywhere without a marrow stem. That's correct. <laughs> but that's not really the question I'm asking. The question I'm, the question I'm asking is, what is the positional information that gives rise to these cells becoming marrow So one way to do it would be to remove other cells during this development and see whether that affects the marrow stem. Yeah, that would work. That would work. And it turns out that these cells that are labeled here in red, if you have laid out those cells, you do not get a shoot apical marrow stem. So essentially what that means is signals that are being produced in these cells are, the, are signals that are important for production of the shoot apical marrow stem. You could go through then and find out what genes are being expressed, and they find out there's this gene called W.S. Wuschel is a key gene that's important in defining the cells that will be the shoot apical meristem. So it's a set of signals that are being set up from very early in the globular stage that predetermine these cells to become part of the shoot apical meristem. You delete that gene, these cells do not become meristematic. Okay, so sort of the physical approach, remove specific cells, or the genetic approach, knock out specific genes, you can, sort, you can sort out what are the cells and what are the signals that are giving rise to the formation of the shoot apical meristem. Okay, let's see, I think we probably, yes. Let's stop there, and next time we'll just finish up. I want to talk a little, just give you some idea about the question that you asked, how does, how do the patterns of cell division, so here's our dome of the shoot apical meristem. And eventually off of that dome, rap, more rapid cell division in specific locations are going to get, end up determining where along the axis of this shoot the leaves are going to be located. So they're going to be opposite each other or they're going to be in some other patterns. That's all determined by where these leaf primordia are initiated on the dome of the shoot apical meristem. So we'll finish up next time just talking briefly about that, and then we'll go on to start talking about light signaling in plants and phytochromes.